tell you, we're having way too much fun. <laughs> what do you think the Lord's doing? Huh? My suspicions, He's on up in heaven wiping His eye and laughing and slapping His knee. <laughs> Oh, my. Well, the Lord's been very, very long to help. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Lord's been very, very good to us. And we're thankful for all that He has, has done. Uh, we ha- are in the middle of a series that is, uh, everybody knows what's going on in the community and uh, the humiliation we've had, we got some more of it in the paper again this week. Uh, we found we had a truck we didn't even know we had. And all sorts of all sorts of stuff is, is going on. Having said that, uh, we're in the process of the church as trying to, we're begging the Lord to give us a healthy community, uh, give us a healthy church, and and help us to have a positive impact. Help us, help uh, uh, Oakley Community Church to have a bigger influence around this community than uh, the friendly tavern or the little bar. And, and uh, I believe the Lord's work. Believe the Lord's work. But in order to have revival, revival always starts when you begin preaching about sin. It always starts in the church. And and so. Uh, We've been talking about poverty and we've been talking about uh, uh, alcoholism and and we're into the subject of abuse. And what we've learned about abuse is that unlike alcoholism and poverty, which are violations of wisdom, abuse is a violation of love. And our, our theme scripture has been the most important commandment answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than needs. And so the idea of love is at the foundation of everything we have. And when we begin taking, thinking about abuse in all of its forms, uh, uh, it, is, it is simply acting self-centered, selfishly, and anything but in love. Um, t- uh, today, uh, last time I preached, we talked about domestic abuse. And in that discussion, we noted that uh, domestic abuse takes several forms, uh, ranging from verbal abuse, emotional abuse, up to domestic violence. Unfortunately, and this, this is, gen- this is it's sadly I'd probably the better word, uh, domestic violence is uh, so common that um, I believe I need to take a, ser- a sermon and devote to it. Did you know that according to the statisticians, one in four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime? When I learned that statistic, I have four daughters. What do you think that did to me? Put me on my knees. Put me on my knees. I, I can tell you that. And uh, it's very real. Furthermore, uh, I know that several of you, I've learned your stories, and, and several of you in here have experienced domestic violence. You've been... Uh, the object of it and the, the humiliation, the degradation, um, the destruction of your self-image, all of that uh, is, has been difficult. And unfortunately, it's, it's part of, of, uh, of your story here. Um, I'd like to begin this by looking at what does Scripture say about violence. Let's, let's look there first. And we begin in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6, and verses 11 through 13. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, 
For all the people had corrupted their ways. I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is full of violence because of them. I'm going to destroy both them and the earth. What we know here is, is the thing behind the flood, the thing that, that drove behind the flood, was violence. You begin to think about that just a little bit. You begin to get some idea of what God has to say about it. And we can talk about the flood, and we can talk about all those kind of things. But what we've got to start focusing on is, is that because of the violence, God flooded the earth and destroyed it. Okay? That, that gives us some idea of where he is. Now, here's another take on, here's another interesting thing. Uh, where we are here is uh, uh, oh, uh, Jacob is uh, on his deathbed. And he is blessing his 12 sons. Now, a little background. Simeon and Levi uh, took advantage of the situation, and they were very violent in their lives and destroyed whole towns and stuff. Well, when they had done that, their father is on their dying bed. He's, he's on his dying bed. He is giving them his fatherly blessing. And listen to this blessing. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Hmm. What do we mean by that? The problem that we have with, let's take a gun or a knife, is that it can either be used to provide and protect, or it can be used as a weapon to coerce and to destroy. One is a use of a weapon. It's a tool. The other is the abuse of a weapon. And what Jacob notes about his sons, what he says about them is, their swords are weapons of violence. Nothing good came out of what should have been the tools to protect and provide for their family. Let me not enter into their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they've killed men in their angers and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Notice that what happens to these violent men's family. They are, they, it says they're dispersed. What happens is is they lose their family blessing. They, they just get absorbed, and they are now no longer identifiable as a tribe. And that's exactly what happened. Their violence caused them to have their name and their posterity taken from the earth. Violence. This is our reading for today. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. This is set, this psalm is set where David is being pursued by his enemies and he's concerned about his safety and his life. And he makes a faith statement. God's in his temple, and God's on his throne. We need to remember that. We need to remember that God is on his throne. We may tend to forget that. We think things get along, things go fine. But let's remember something. God's in his temple, and he's on his throne, and he observes and his eyes examine men. Now please understand, God watches you. I remember growing up, brother and sister Cleve Green used to sing, There's an eye watching you. There's a great big, remember that song, Charlie? There's an eye watching you, great big eye watching. 
Did you ever stop and think when you stopped and took that drink that there's an eye watching you? Uh, you know, well, it's the thing of it is, and our behavior and what we're doing with God, there is an eye watching us. And what happens is, is we have become so sophisticated and so uh, that we just don't think about God watching what we're doing. But please remember, God's on His temple. He's sitting on His throne. And his eye is watching all of our behavior. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. Now look, God may love us as children and as his creation, but violent people his soul hates deep inside. Now, I'm not sure I want to be on that side of God. You want to do something to make God hate you? Just get violent. By the way, I have never done a study on violence in the Bible before, but when I got done, it scared the bejeebies out of me. Right? Come on! God's watching, and God hates. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. Um, if, what, you, what you get on that brimstone is what in the King James I would call it. Fire and brimstone. He's going to do that. Scorching wind will be their lot. Scorching wind in, in, in that area, in the area of the Middle East, especially down in the southern parts of Israel, in the area of the Negev, where it comes off that... Uh, Arabian Desert there out of Saudi Arabia, they get hot winds that come out that are uh, above 100 degrees. And when it goes through, it just scorches everything. Everything dries up. And so what's happening here, instead of being prospered by God, what they're going to get is a scorching wind, and what they do is going to dry up and die. The Lord's righteous. He loves justice. That right man will see his face. Third thing. I love this one. For the Lord will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save them from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. That's the next thing. To those that are caught in a web of domestic violence, they're often homeless. It's a very difficult, sticky situation. But what we have here is a promise from God. I love your blood. I love you. And I'm going to protect you. Okay? I'm going to rescue from the oppression and violence. Now, having said that, having said that, he will rescue us from oppression and violence. We don't want to make the mistake that the guy made that a huge flood came through. It's coming. And the rescuers came down and they said, you need to evacuate. The river's rising. We're going to have a flood. And he said, no, I'm not going, I'm not going to uh, uh, evacuate. The Lord's going to take care of me. Well, they sent another group out said, you need to evacuate. Well, okay, uh, I don't need to evacuate. The Lord's going to save me. Well, pretty soon uh, the river comes up, and he's stuck on the second floor, and they come up in a boat, and they say, quick, get in. You're going to be... Uh, 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 you're going to be drowned. The river's continuing to rise. He says, I don't need to. The Lord's going to rescue me. Well, the water continues to rise. He's stuck on the roof. Helicopter comes along and says, get in. Get, 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 take the rope. Get up. Uh, we're going to, you know, so we can rescue. He says, oh, I don't need to. The Lord's going to rescue me. About that time, the house let goes of, lets go of the uh, foundation. It begins to float down the river. The man is drowned, died. He gets to have it. And he gets the great white throne and he says to God, You said you were going to rescue me. And he said, I said a warning 
I sent a boat. I sent a helicopter. How much more do you need? <laughs> now, the problem with domestic abuse is that when we start talking about this promise to rescue us from oppression, we have to understand that it does not necessarily and probably does not consist of something that's miraculous. It will be in things that are common sense and things that are available to us. So uh, we need to keep that in mind. Well, that's where Scripture leads us. What do you mean by domestic violence, Pastor John? Uh, let's read this first, and then we're going to break it apart a little bit. Domestic violence is a pattern of coercive or controlling behavior used by one individual to gain or maintain power and control over another individual in the context of an intimate relationship. This includes any behaviors that frighten, intimidate, terrorize, explore, manipulate, hurt, humiliate, blame, injure, or wound an intimate partner. Let's, it's easy to read all that, but let's break it apart a little bit and think about it a little bit. First of all, domestic violence is a pattern of coercive or controlling behavior. Now, when we start being co coercive behavior, we're making things to it, controlling behavior. Uh, uh, an example of controlling behavior would be keep taking money away from them um, or uh, call, have, having them call checking on them all the time. Coercive behavior, obviously, in, this, in, the, in the context of uh, domestic violence, we're talking about uh, physically doing things to them. Now, it's used by one individual to gain or maintain power and control over another. Notice what this is all about. Our study teaches us that abuse is a violation of love. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is not love. This is about power and control. Not love. It's not about you. It's about me. And so what we're talking about is something that is done to gain and maintain power and control over another individual in the context of an, an intimate relationship. Now, why do you bring this up? Well, we're talking about domestic violence. And, uh, for instance, a schoolyard bully uses the same thing and stuff like that, but it's not an intimate relationship. What we're talking about here is someone that we're married to, we're dating, we're doing some, but we've got this uh, uh, oh, uh, idea for power and control, and it's a context of a relationship where there's some form of at least, uh, if not spoken, assumed covenant between the people. Now, this includes behaviors that, first of all, frighten. Domestic violence, guy will pull out a gun and say, I'll just shoot you! That's domestic violence. It's meant to frighten. Okay? Uh, uh, it will, uh, there will be, they will do things along that line. To intimidate. One of the things that I have seen a lot is that you get one person that they find something that uh, is a lever over someone and they will use it to intimidate them. For example, she has a beautiful little puppy that she likes. What he will do is threaten to kill the dog. It's intimidating. You don't do it. I'll, I'll do that. And I'll kill it. It's, it's intimidation. It's meant, it's meant to keep people in control. Terrorize. Uh, again, uh, the, the idea of waving a gun or a knife or uh, chasing people around or, or uh, uh, doing things, stalking, that kind of stuff, just meant to terrorize the individual and meant to keep them under control. Now you think of terrorist behavior. You don't, sometimes, you, one of the things that the terrorists want to do with us is they want us, they don't care that they kill all of us, 
It's just that they want the terrorist behavior, the threat of a bomb going off, the threat of those things, terrorize people and they live in fear. And so we, they do things to cause people to live in fear, exploit them, uh, to use them. Uh, in an intimate uh, context, usually their sexual exploitation is involved. Or uh, the thing I see, and I, I just, I, I don't know what's wrong with some girls, but they date these guys. Oh, he's so wonderful. Has he got a job? No. <laughs> but I'm working, and we're getting along fine. We're living in this ramshackle trailer, and we're just in love. <laughs> Lady, you dumb. And what happens is, he's exploiting the thing. Now, the scripture says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Amen. Okay? Now, it, it's one thing to, to struggle finding a job, doing things like this. But these guys are nothing but lazy, and they're looking for a, a, an easy meal ticket. Okay? They're exploiting the people. It's violence. It's violence. Manipulate. Uh, again, you do things to make people uh, do what you want to do, hurt them. And again, here we come to what we usually think about uh, violence. You hit them, you, uh, you, you scratch them, you, you do different things. You hurt them, humiliate them. This is one of the things that uh, becomes a cue to those of us who are on the outside. You see somebody humiliate their spouse in public, Mark it down. It's not meant to be funny. It's meant to control them. It's meant to hurt them. It's meant to keep them in check. And whatever you do, you mark it down. There's problems there. I, it's one thing to tease and step over the line. I, and I've done that with Lucy. We are, I will tell a story. We've got to get out of here. But I've, I've done some dumb things that have humiliated Lucy. But not because I was trying to control her. I was trying to be funny. I'll tell you something. Ain't no man can control loose. <laughs> but, but we can humiliate and, and things. Blame them. Why wouldn't they hit you if you hadn't have said what you said? My daddy told me, when I, was, when I got the talk, remember the talk? I got to talk, my dad told me. I remember my dad's unsaved, he's an alcoholic. But he said to me, son, you never hit a woman. Never. Son, you always respect every woman, regardless of what kind of a woman she is. I didn't know what he was talking about. I learned as I got older. But the point was clear. But what we have here is the idea of blaming them, injuring them, or to wound an intimate part. These are the kind of things that we're talking about when we start talking about domestic violence. Okay, let's talk about some of the violent behaviors. First of all, restraining is restraint is a violent behavior. You grab hold of them, uh, you hold them down, you do whatever. Restraint is a violent behavior. Pushing and shoving is a violent behavior. Uh, choking or strangling, lots of times you put them up against the wall, choke them, whatever, uh, that's wrong. Hitting in any form. Well, I just slapped her if she needed it. Now someone needed to put a ball back to your head. I don't seem to have much patience with these guys, do I? <laughs> Okay, we've talked about what it is. We've seen what Scripture has to say. What are we going? To, what should we do as a victim? Now, let me point out that when you're dealing with victims of abuse, they are intimidated, they are humiliated, they are emotionally abused to the point that they have. They don't have low self-esteem. They have no self-esteem. They, they believe they're ugly. They believe nobody else would have them. 
They believed nobody would do anything at all like that with them. So when we start talking about, well, what do you need to do? You need to understand that these are major, major steps for them. Okay? But you have to do something. Number one, call the police. Okay? Uh, it's one thing to call me, and I'll certainly come in and, and try and talk to you, but I can't do anything about it. You call Craig. He's got a gun. He's going to stop it. Okay? Right. Uh, he's been trained on how to handle those things. I've been trained to preach, not not break up a fight. <laughs> and so, so please understand, the first thing you do is call the police. Now, you may not, again, part of the whole thing is, is they'll cut the phone lines, they'll take your cell phone away, they'll do all that kind of stuff. So the answer is you call the police as soon as possible when you can. Uh, the second thing is, is press charges. One of the most frustrating poor parts of domestic abuse and what uh, police will tell you is that they go to the same houses all the time. They know exactly what's going on. And what you have to realize about domestic abuse situations are they are extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think more officers, more officers are killed in the line of duty and in bringing up domestic violence than any other in any other kind of uh, of uh, violence that's going on. Potential, potential for murder and mayhem. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's way above everything else on domestic even violence. Traffic stop. Pardon? Even traffic stop. Yeah, even, even traffic stop. stop. You know what 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 gets everybody's attention? Well, somebody pulled a gun on the officer. Uh, Craig here, you know, I wanted to make a traffic stop, but, but domestic violence is extremely serious. What happens is, is after uh, they get together, she says, well, I love him, and I, I had a part in it, I should Baloney! Sin is sin! And there's no excuse and no reason to do that. Press charges. Second thing, or third thing, ask for help. The problem is, is that where you are, chances are you are not going to get out of this alone. You're going to have to have someone walk with, with you through it. That's why it's good to have, you know, call a pastor, call a friend at church, whatever. By the way, let me, let me comment on this here. If you study the statistics, uh, people who are involved in abusive relationships, Christians who attend church regularly and are involved in a, in a relationship are about three times less likely to get out of them than people who have no Christian background. Mm. Well, you know, Jesus, no, Jesus does. You know, we, we got to do that. We'll deal with this a little bit more. But our problem is, is, is we we want to do it. But but Christians, and we need to we need to talk about asking for help. We need to make an escape plan. Again, you need help on the outside. Go ahead and do that. Again, I uh, this I, I we spent uh, a week at one of our pastors or three four days at Pastors Institute being trained on what to do in domestic violence. I'm supposed to tell you what to do in 30 minutes. Ain't going to happen. But uh, I just got to give you some things. But you got to ask for help. Make an escape plan. Go to a shelter. They are here. And uh, we can help you get there. Okay, what if you suspect abuse? One thing. Only one thing you can do. Make a discreet inquiry. That's all you can do. Again, I would have going to put in there, you know, got a whole list of things of what to look for. Uh, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, and flies like a duck, it's a duck. Might be a possum. <laughs> <laughs> Make a discreet inquiry and pray, but please remember something. These are extremely violent. And what you may do is you can jeopardize the life of the individual involved. Oh, Pastor, you're you're kidding. Have you you listen to the news every night? Stalking, 
uh, uh, families are killed. Uh, we hear it regularly on our news around here. Uh, the abuser, uh, okay, so you got a, a PPO on it. He'll come around, shoot you and all the kids that shoot himself. It happens regularly. So please be under, please understand that this has to be done carefully. It's extremely violent, and you probably <coughs> need to have authorities in there that can provide some measure of protection. Offer to help? Question, big question. We're going to end with this one. Does God expect me to stay in an abusive marriage? No. Now, I can, I, 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 theologically, I can take it scripturally, and I can prove it to you. I'm just going to tell you, no. That's right. No. Violence breaks the marriage covenant. When I walk down the aisle with Lucy, I promise to love her. Right? Isn't that one? Isn't that my bad? Now, when I promise to love her, that covenant says that I am going to forget about myself and I'm going to do what is best for her and the relationship. Right? Isn't that what love means? Amen. Come on. Oh, we don't like that. Oh, love is, I, I just fell in love for a second. My heart went flutter and it was just all hearts and flowers and butterflies. Listen, when he's shaking a gun in your face, it's not hearts and flowers and butterflies. It's crime. Okay? But that's the vow you made. You vowed that you would not intentionally hurt your spouse. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you break that vow to love, oh, gee whiz, we started there, didn't we? Abuse is a, is a violation of the law of love. If you break that covenant, is the covenant still valid? No. No. Now, I can take you scripturally. I know some, some of the things Jesus said. And I can work you through some of the things Jesus said that get read into it that aren't there. And that's a whole other sermon, and we'll deal with it if we need to. But the short answer is no. Violence breaks the marriage covenant, and you have every right to get out, and God expects you to. Let me list, let me land with this thought. This is our text today. From the fruit of his lips, a man enjoys good things, but the unfaithful have a craving for violence. Let's see, we just talked about being unfaithful to the marriage vows. Wow. So we understand that unfaithfulness tends to breed violence. And it doesn't have to be sexual immorality. Being unfaithful is being unfaithful to that vow to love. And when you said, when I said, I, John, take you, Lucy, to love, to have and to hold, and to love from this day forth, I have made a covenant. And if I break that, that's just it. People break covenants. They don't want to deal with it. They want to push. They want to shove. They want to hit. They want to do whatever they can to make sure they're in control. But they're unfaithful. They're unfaithful. Well, let's pray, and then we'll have communion. Heavenly Father, done the best. Lord, only you know, in my heart,